So uh, today I want to talk about that passage of scripture and, and the understanding. We're in Second Peter chapter 3. That God is not slack. God hasn't forgotten his promises to us. And, and very particularly, God hasn't forgotten his promise to return. And the implications of that in our life. Because sometimes we can forget that, that we're, we're sojourners on this earth. If we're citizens of the kingdom, then in, in many ways we're passing through. Now we think, oh, this earth is our home. But, but the reality is... We have a reward that awaits us because Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you and, and if I go, I will return for you. And, and so we still understand that and God hasn't forgotten it. Um, and, and so I, I was thinking in those terms this morning. And as we look at Second Peter, uh, just to intro it, I see verses, I want to talk about verses one and two for a minute. Um, Knowing Christ will yet return to the church, Peter opens chapter 3 uh, by announcing and identifying the purpose he has in writing the things we're going to look at today. And so, uh, starting with verse 1, and read, I'm just going to read verses 1 and 2 for now. It says, Dear friends, this is the second letter I'm writing to you. In both letters, I'm trying to refresh your memory. I want you to remember the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and, and what the Lord and Savior commanded you through your apostles. And, and so when we think of that, uh, things we need to be reminded of is what he's addressing. And, and we understand that life gets busy and we get distracted with needs and raising families and earning money and taking care of of our homes and all of those kinds of things so much that we can be distracted from the important reality and that's what Peter's reminding of us of. And, and when I think of the multitude of concerns that people express about what is going on in this world, I see the importance of a message like this. To be reminded of that which is important, not just that which is urgent. And I think that's the struggle of life in our day and age is that people are always trying to deal with what is urgent and forgetting to deal with what is important. And you know what that's like. You get up in the morning and you think of all the things you need to get done right away and what has to happen and, and all of that. But, but to manage our lives well, we have to think beyond the urgent and think about the important. And, and, you know, I, I don't like using myself example, as an example. I think Debbie likes it better than I do. I actually watched her sermon when I was gone. And um, whatever she says about me isn't true. I don't know what the deal is there. But um, I understand on any given day, I have things that have to be done that are urgent. But they always have to come after my time with the Lord when I get up because that's important. And, and generally, I do wake up between 4.30 and 5. And uh, the purpose of that is so I can deal with what's important before I have to deal with what's urgent. And, it, you know, and, and when we're traveling, if we have to catch a plane at 5, I'm up at 2 or 3 because I will deal with what's important long before I ever deal with what is urgent. And, and that is something we need to be reminded of because this earthly life too many times is about what is, seems urgent to us and almost never about what seems important in the eyes of the Lord. And I find it fascinating even as we look at that that um, <clears throat> Peter in his writing in the first century accurately predicts the conditions of the 21st century. If you want something that, that, that stirs up faith within you, think about the fact that in the first century he is predicting a condition and, and, and events and things that are happening now. That some 2,000 years later, we're realizing that he predicted the current condition of our society. That should wake us up to consider that which is important. I 
I, I'm just thinking, and and <clears throat> it's 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 interesting to me. Actually, Debbie and I will have conversations, and I confess that you know um, church attendance weighs heavier on her mind than it does mine, and I think it's probably because um, I'm more philosophical about everything. But but. I, you know, if you were to ask me, I, I, you know, I came to the Lord in the late '70s, and if you were to ask me my my values about being here, and, and you're here, and I'm grateful for that. That the Bible says, "Forsake not the assembling together of the saints," and and it's always been our practice to make that assembling together important, because there are a lot of things that go on in our lives that are urgent, that seem urgent or exciting, or or even something we'd rather do. But, but we always have to come back to what we must do. And so I never actually have a Sunday morning. You might notice that. If I'm not in service here, it's because I'm in service somewhere else when I'm gone. And I never have a Sunday morning where I wake up and I think, I wonder if I'm going to go to church today. I don't have a, a Saturday night where I think, um, do I want to go to church or do I want to go do this other thing? And, and even on vacation, right? So we were in Mexico. I got up and went to church. And um, I was very glad that they... It, I went to a Catholic church because that's what was within walking distance. And, and I actually enjoyed it. And, and um, I was really glad they'd written everything down because I don't speak Spanish particularly well. There might have been a time in my life when I did a little better, but I can generally sort what I'm reading. And uh, so they wrote it all down, and, and I liked that. And, and as I'm reading, I'm going, wait a second, we're reading the Apostles' Creed. I know this. And, and, and all of that. But it was, you know, it's like, well, why would you go? You don't understand everything. Because I would not forsake the assembling of the saints because it's important. That's why. And some of you should be able to identify with that because you don't always know what I'm saying. <laughs> Which is okay, because maybe I don't. You know, I always know what I'm saying. Um, unless I'm sleeping through it or something. So as we look at, at the rest of this, in, in verses 3 and 4, he writes this. First, you must understand this. In the last days, people who follow their own desires will appear. These disrespectful people ridicule God's promise by saying, what's happened to this promise to return? Ever since our ancestors died, everything continues as it did from the beginning of the world. Note the condition that he's identifying here for the last days, and compare it to our present world. Even when he says people will emerge, people will will begin to appear who follow their own desires. We don't have to look very far to see that. We we are, are surrounded by people who follow their own desires. We are living with the decisions of people who follow their own desires. And, and I'm not trying to be anti-government or even anti-democracy, but we are starting to see the, the end results of what happens when the majority make the decisions. And they're not always healthy decisions. Because instead of making decisions based on what is known to be right, they are based on the desires of people instead of the wisdom of God. And we're seeing that take place in our culture. And I'm not blaming our democracy for it. I'm blaming humanity for it. It's the breakdown of humanity that's causing the demise of society. It's, it's, it has nothing to do with government and everything to do with, with the heart conditions of the, of the multitude. And, and Peter predicts this. And, and he goes further to say these people, these disrespectful people, and he uses a word in Greek, because I know you love Greek, right? Impictes, and, and it means scoffers and, or mockers or false teachers. And, and he says people who, who mock the truth of God will emerge. Wow. So that's happening. 
And, and I'm not overly concerned that it happens in the world, to be honest with you. I, I, you know, uh, we've had to deal with people who didn't believe in the Lord and lived in the world's culture that would mock the things of the Lord for a long time. My own dad, before he became a Christian and later a pastor, um, he used to, he used to uh, back in the day, the churches would have loudspeakers outside the church. So you'd, you'd hear the whole church service. So he stole those. Right? Because he didn't want to hear it. But later when he got saved and was going to that church, he had to make amends for that. So, so the idea of people that mock or scoff the things the Lord isn't new, people in the world do that. But I, I think what I find remarkably disconcerting is that now we have people naming the name of Jesus that mock the things of the Lord. Now we have people that are saying they're believers that mock the faithfulness of true believers. And, and, and that, that shocks me, you know, that I took my first senior pastorate in 1982 and and I have to tell you, the things I dealt with then are different than the things I have to deal with now. The things that, you know, in fact, um, actually I'll tell a story on a friend of mine who started in about the same time frame. He's one of our supervisors in Northern California now, but... Um, he, he told a story, and, I, and as he was telling the story, I was thinking, man, that, I remember stuff like that. It, it, and now it seems so innocuous compared to what it seemed like in, in 1982. And, and he said, I, was, I went over to some people's house, and, and, and we were all there kind of fellowshipping and eating, and I think they were playing um, one of those card games that you guys like to play um, with four people. What is that called? They play it back here all the time. Pinochle, there you go. No comments from the Pinochle Gallery. But in any case, they were playing that. And, and um, I don't, it's, it, I'm sure it's a fine game. It's just not my thing. And, um, <clears throat> and it was one of those older houses where the kitchen was completely separate and it had a swinging door and everything. And so all of us, there came a point where one of his, his deacons comes up to him and says, Pastor, can I talk to you in the kitchen for a minute? And the pastor goes in it. And uh, so um, he says to Dennis, he says, um, just now I came in the kitchen and I, the other man's wife was in here and we kissed and, and I need to tell you. And Dennis, he's, he's just appalled at it. He's shocked. He can't believe it. And he says, well, just stop it. And the guy says, I will never, that, I feel so wrong. I, I would never do that again. And and we had talked, and both over the, our history of pastoring, you know, something happened in the late 90s and at the turn of the millennium that I thought to myself, I wish that was all I ever had to deal with. I wish that was the only kind of sin I had to deal with compared to the kind of stuff we have to deal with in the church today. And, and I don't mean that as, a, as an attack or anything, it's just, it's a, re, it's a real observation over a lifetime of service in the church. That, uh, when, when, when that kind of infidelity becomes innocuous and, and, and small by comparison, there is something horribly wrong in the, in the midst of people who name the name of Jesus. And don't get me wrong, I think that's an unthinkable act. It just seems so small compared to stuff that goes on now. And so in the last days, even in the church, there are people who mock the things of the Lord. And these same people, they'll question Christ's promise to return. And that's where some of it comes from. You know, early on when I was growing up in the Lord, I, you, you had this understanding that you know, the Lord could come back, and, and I don't know, you know, if anything could happen, I could die, the Lord could come back. How I live from day to day matters. I need to get up each day and try to do the right thing because I, I want to go to be with him. But something has shifted where people never think about that reality anymore. And, and, and it's like, well, you know, yeah, the Lord has said he'll come back, but will he? 
And I've even heard theologians talk as though the, the return of the Lord might not come. And, I, and I'm thinking, how do you get that from what Jesus said? Well, of course, we know it's spiritual blindness. But these same people, they will say, uh, you know, it's been the same for all of human history. Everything from the beginning to now has been the same. Is Christ really going to come back? But, but listen to the words of Jesus as he makes the church a promise. And we read about those in John chapter 14. And I, and I just want to look at verses 2 and 3 uh, as the Lord shares his promise with us. And he says, In my Father's house has many rooms. If that were not true, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? I'll go to prepare a place for you Therefore, I will come again. Then I will bring you into my presence so that you will be where I am. That's a promise to the Lord. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I'm coming back to bring you there. And, and in, in, it's a very real analogy uh, from the Hebrew culture. It's a Hebraism to understand what that meant. And it's, a very, it's about the marriage of the church to the Lord, the bride to the bridegroom. And... The way it worked in the Hebrew culture and a lot of the Middle East, but particularly we, we can recognize it in the first century uh, Hebrew culture, where when a, when a young man wanted to marry a young woman, when there was a betrothal, the young man would, would say goodbye and he would go to add on to the living quarters of his family. Because and he would have to build an apartment or, or or a neighboring house or something of that nature within the father's holdings to bring his bride to. And and he could never go back to get his bride until his own father said, That's good enough for one of my daughters. And, and he, would, he would labor on it until his father approved of what he was providing for his new bride. Because his father saw that he was adopting this bride as a daughter. And, and it had to be good enough. And, and when we, so when Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you, everybody listening to him understood what he was saying. That there's a betrothal promise here between us. So when Jesus tells the church that, he's saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And the reality is, he doesn't return until his father says, that place is ready. And then, of course, we read in Revelation, there's another factor too. The father at one point will say, the bride has made herself ready. And, and if, if, if there's anything that's in our responsibility, it's that. The bride needs to make herself ready. And, and, and the problem is the bride doesn't think about making herself ready because the bride is not no longer convinced that the groom is returning. That the church needs to make itself ready for the return of Jesus. But if the church forgets that there is a promise and the Lord keeps his promises, the church will fail to ready itself for a life in heaven. And, and we live in that kind of a culture that says, well, I'm just waiting for the Lord to make everything that's bad in me to go away. And the Lord's saying, I'm waiting for you to get rid of it. And, and, you know, we, we have all those things in our lives. Everybody wants something. And, and I'm trying, you know, I'm scanning my mind for an illustration I could use. And I've decided to use the idea of playing a musical instrument. And I, as some of you might know, I play one or two of them. Actually, I think we counted it was like 23. But just to say, that doesn't happen on accident. And some of them kind of cross over because once you learn to play something with strings, you just there are a lot of things with strings you can play. So like mandolins and violins are tuned the same, and so you can play those, and that means they're a lot like violas and mandolas. And so that multiplies it. So it's not that as cool as it sounds. 
But everyone I've ever met would love to be a musician. But they don't want to become one. You see, and, and I've said, you know, I tell people just 15 minutes a day. You'd be amazed at what will happen. And everybody comes, who's, who, if people would take me on that, like eventually Debbie did. And, and so she started learning to play the guitar and, and I, you know, 15 minutes a day. And, and she comes back and says, I, I, I always want to go longer. I said, yeah, I knew, you, I knew that. I knew that. I just say 15 minutes a day to make it sound easier. But, but you're not going to stay there. And, and, and that's the distinction. Everybody wants to be a musician, but they don't want to become one because it requires sacrifice and dedication. It requires time where you just work with the instrument and figure out how to make what it sounds like. And, and you, you work on different compositions and you practice and you do these things. It requires something of you. And we could apply that to other things. People want to be athletes, but there's a sacrifice there. People want to be healthy, but there's a sacrifice there. People want to be educated, but there's a sacrifice involved there. And it, it can go on like that. But the analogy points to one reality that the church has to grasp. Many people want to be Christians, but almost none of them want to become Christians. That it's not enough to just want to be something. You must want to become something. And the idea of a Christian in, in the, the Greek word it actually means little Christ. And, and it's the, it, it was a derogatory term to be sure when they used it in Antioch. But if you could think of it as a chip off the old block. Someone patterned after the master. And we think of that in terms of Romans 8, 29. That those whom he... He foreknew, he predestined that they be conformed to his son, Christ Jesus. And becoming a Christian has this, this expectation that we become conformed to the image of Christ Jesus. That we indeed become a little Christ, a pa someone pattern, patterned after the master. That you don't just be that, you become it. It's not something that you're born with, it's something that you develop. And, and the calling of the Lord is on that. And if we forget that he's gone to prepare a place for us, we'll forget to do that. And if we continue, we see that they are, Peter goes on to say in verse 5, um, I'm going to read 5 through 7, they are deliberately ignoring one fact. Because of God's word, heaven and earth existed a long time ago. The earth appeared out of water and was kept alive by water. Water also flooded and destroyed the world. By God's word, the present heaven and earth are designated to be burned. They're being kept until the day ungodly people will be judged and destroyed. And, and first, he identifies that there will be individuals who will deny the origin of the species in creation. They will forget that all came into existence when God said, let there be. Well, let there be light, let there be this, let there be that. When God did it, they will forget it was formed by his word. And, and because of God's word in heaven and earth existed a long time ago, because God spoke it into existence, and, and <clears throat> people will look at history and say, well, we've always been here, forgetting that God spoke it into existence, but if God could speak it into existence, he can speak it out of existence. And that's what Peter's really getting at. Uh, it's interesting that he predicted a time in humanity when people would no longer believe in the creative process of God. And even in the church. Even, even in, in those who would say they're Christians, there are people who no longer believe in the creative process of God. And that it was predicted is evidential to us that God's word is true about these things. 
And, and as evidence of, of, of the destruction of life, Peter uses the flood as an example when he says that, you know, God spoke water into existence and everything was existing by water and then God spoke to the water and told it to destroy the earth. And the flood becomes proof that the universe could be burned up. And the real reality is that the very universe that we count on, the very one we know, the very one we depend on, will not last forever. And, and you get up and you think, well, in the, in the morning the sun will rise and I'll get up. What, well, what if you don't get up? What if the sun doesn't rise? What will you do if everything changes in a moment? And if you're keeping track of the kinds of things that are going on around us, you know that everything looks differently than it used to. And, and, and as I've, as I've uh, intimated and made clear for us, there are even believers, theologians, and pastors who would, who would intimate that the earth won't be destroyed. But the Bible says it will. And, and, and so we want to follow the logic that if, if the earth was created by the Lord, as Peter mentions it, and a global flood happened, and then people lose their desire for the Lord, just as he said they would, then we know the end will happen, just as he's predicting. If his predictions have come true and been true, then, then each statement of that prediction we can depend on. And it also agrees with the Lord in Matthew 24 or in Mark 13, both places, where the Lord says, you know, you'll see all these things happening and then, right, the stars are going to fall from the sky and things are going to happen and then you'll see me coming in the clouds. So it agrees. And incidentally, that's in a chapter where Jesus predicts the destruction of, of Jerusalem. And it all flows together. It's one prediction. Jerusalem be, will be destroyed. There'll be signs, wars, earthquakes. And then you'll see everything fall apart and then I'll come back. It's one long prediction. Well, Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. So it's not figurative speech. It's a literal prediction because part of it comes true Then we know the other part has to. And so I was in a conversation with one theologian who was a professor at, at Fuller uh, some time back, and, and uh, he tried to tell me that we don't take this particular passage literally, right? And I said, so um, you don't believe in the laws of physics either, do you? He said, what, what do you mean? I said, well, every phys physicist knows that no star is infinite, well, what are you trying to say? I said, well, we already have evidence that all planets and stars die. It's a reality. That, that, you know, the sun will at some point have a supernova and all will be destroyed. So not only are you denying the scriptures, you're denying physics. And when both physics and scriptures agree together, you should wake up. We didn't become close friends. And I have to wonder, in all fairness, if it's because light and darkness aren't compatible. So how do we explain the, the Lord taking time to return? And of course, Peter answers that for us. Dear friends, don't ignore this fact. One day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. And I love that as a from a theological perspective and also a scientific one because we know that, that in terms of, you, you love the laws of physics, I'm sure, but we know that time and matter and space have to exist together. You can't have time, matter, or space apart from each other. And, and because, right, because matter cannot, two, two objects of matter cannot share the same space. That's why you each have your own chair. Okay? Now, if one of you moves 
another object of matter can occupy that space, but at a different time. So time, space, and matter have to exist simultaneously. So when God created space and matter, when God created the heavens and the earth, he also created time. And you read about it in Genesis, right? The sun went up and the sun went down, and that was a day, a 24-hour period. Boom, God created time. If he created it, he's not part of it. He's not controlled by it. He's not, it doesn't contain him. It, it doesn't restrict him. He's outside of it. You, you're bound by it. He's not. And that's why Peter says, you know, to him a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. What is he saying? God doesn't have a watch. He doesn't need a watch. You're, you're looking at, you, and by the way, this is a good application for our lives, not just the return of the Lord. You're, you're making prayers and you're at, waiting for God to answer those prayers and you're hoping things will happen and you're thinking, God, you know, you're, you're missing a really good opportunity here to be early. He's never late, but he misses opportunities to be early and never on accident. And you're thinking, God, why are you delaying? He's like, I'm not trapped by your schedule. Your calendar, your agenda, it doesn't mean anything to the Lord. He's not trapped within your time. And, and you know, in fact, if we look at, at the promises of the Messiah, if we go back to Genesis and the, the, seed, of, the seed of the woman will bruise, the heel of the, the woman's seed will bruise the head of the serpent, that's a, that's a messianic promise, right? And then in... in Moses' day, he says, you know, there'll be a prophet like me that'll come. And he's speaking of Jesus. And we see all these prophetic things about the Messiah. So the people of Israel were praying for the Messiah for thousands of years before God answered that prayer. And it's interesting. We always think our prayers have to be answered while we're alive. They don't. And so we, we see these things. And so there's the faithfulness of God to, to wait and to tarry. We realize it's a love-based act. He doesn't want to destroy. He wants everyone to have a chance. And I love that. First of all, God's not bound by my schedule. Secondly, he's bound by his own love. He's not willing you know, and I, I thought about how that I would apply that in my, my own thinking as, a, as just a, an individual who loves the Lord and, and, and a church historian and knowing that in church history there were people who were, were longing for the return of the Lord. They wanted it to happen in their time. And I'm so glad that the Lord delayed because if the Lord would have returned when they wanted him to, I would have never known him. There were people before I was even born that wanted the Lord to come back, and I would have never known him. I wouldn't have even had life. And then in my own lifetime, I remember as a, as a young guy going to church in, in total rebellion against the Lord, hearing people say, I just wish the Lord would come back tomorrow, and I would have gone to hell if he had. And, and they didn't know they were wishing for my eternal judgment when they wished for an early return of the Lord. And, and that's the challenge upon us, of course. Do we want the Lord to return because we, we want him or because we are just tired of life? And I begin to think about that and I realize that when the Lord returns for me, whether it's through my death or his rapture, I will have had my last opportunity to speak to a lost soul. And, and, and should I be glad that the Lord is patient? That he's not willing that any should perish? Because he tarried long enough so that I wouldn't have to perish. And are there people yet to come to him?
And sometimes when people talk about their desire for the return of the Lord, I want the Lord to return, but I want it to be in his timing. But sometimes people sound more like they care about themselves than the salvations of others or the millions who will die without Jesus if God didn't follow his own plan. And so I believe that the Lord will return when he knows there is no one left to repent. Because he's not willing that any should perish. And we kind of see that in Revelation, by the way. Well, we actually absolutely do see that in Revelation. So right after you see the church is in heaven, everybody's in white robes, they're waving palm branches, and they're singing to the Lord, and they're of every nation, tribe, and tongue. Then the bulls of wrath are being poured out. And, and there are a couple times as the judgment of God is being poured out on earth, it says men are hiding from God knowing that he's doing these things and, and all these things. But then it says, and for all of that, they would not repent. And, and, and we realize just by looking at that, once you see every tribe and nation and tongue in heaven worshiping the Lord, from then on, nothing that happens on earth causes any repentance to take place. Wow. So God has a reason for waiting. Knowing that all this will take place and that will happen at an unexpected time, we should regularly be thinking of what kind of holy and godly life we should be living. That's what Peter says. He tells us that. The bulk of the New Testament talks of Christians dealing with the sin that remains. We, you know, we get distracted by so many things in Scripture and, and so many theologies and the people, some people are hung up on the gifts and some people are hung up on, diff, on only prophecy and some people are hung up on miracles and some people are hung up on the last days and everything. But if you were to just take the Scripture and put it in a balance, the, the bulk, just the general a critical mass of the New Testament talks about the sin that you let remain in your life. That should say something to us. And it should be our primary concern, our reward for being diligent and diligently disciplined is the new heaven and the new earth. Imagine living in a place where everything in it has God's approval. I, I mean... That would be an amazing experience. And when we think about it, we know as we read Genesis that he created everything. And it says right after, it, it says he created everything in heaven and earth and then he said it is very good. In Hebrew, it's mahod tob tob, meaning vehemently good, good. He said everything is just good. And then the serpent had a chat with Eve. And man sinned. And I can't believe since that point that God looks at everything on earth and says it's good. Things changed. Not every... See, before Eve and Adam and Eve fell and sinned, everything had God's approval. Since then, everything has not had his approval. But when he returns... When there's a new heaven and a new earth, we will be in a place where everything has God's approval. What? That's what will make, that's partially what will make it heaven. I look forward to that. But personally, I want to look into my own life and heart and labor to see that it meets with God's approval now. Let's bow our heads. Lord, help us with this. As there is an attack in this world, and I believe it is a genuine and true spiritual attack in this world against the truth of God. And there are people that are being uh, deceived and led astray to think that you won't return. 
uh, that, that so many people are trapped in naturalism. They cannot believe in the supernatural return of Christ. And it's affecting how the church lives. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in our hearts to stir us up. To become aware that it could be today. It could be the next day. But when it comes, it will be a perfect timing based on the will and wisdom of the Father. And may we consider how we should live holy and godly lives in this present time. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you. As always, the kids will be in the fellowship hall. There's coffee and stuff there. Go visit people and make new friends. Amen.